My name is Casey Hirsch. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, author, and founder of LightYourSparkle.life. Today, I'm here with a very special guest, Dr. Chris Rodswan from the University at Buffalo. He is a health psychologist and director of the Pilot Studies Program in the Division of Behavioral Medicine. His work focuses on providing behavioral treatments for medical patients with chronic illnesses ranging from traumatic brain injury, migraines, low back pain, multiple sclerosis, and irritable bowel syndrome, to name a few. He believes that the goal of behavioral counseling for chronic pain is less about lowering pain levels on a scale and more about helping patients develop strategies and skills to help improve their quality of life. I'm in particularly interested in the work of a um, university at Buffalo that incorporates cognitive behavioral therapy and also breath work as a way to help patients feel more empowered over living with these conditions and also helping with symptom management. I myself living with Crohn's disease love the work that they're doing at University at Buffalo because it really supports the importance of the mind-body connection and also gives us tools and ways to think about interventions that can actually help us manage symptoms and feel better in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's get started. I live with an autoimmune condition called Crohn's disease, and I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. So my world of mental health and mind body plus Crohn's really brought me to Dr. Meyer's work, Emron Meyer's work, mm -hmm. which really changed a lot for me because up until I saw his work, I, there wasn't really much conversation about the connection between childhood trauma and these, you know, functional gastrointestinal disorders. And I always knew intuitively that my condition was deeply rooted in the early childhood trauma that I experienced, but I only knew that, you know, intuitively, no one really validated, you know, these connections. And so then that opened the door to me meeting Dr. Lackner and, you know, I, as a therapist, I didn't know there were all these behavioral techniques going on mm -hmm. that where you guys are actually studying ways to help people cope with these conditions and, I know there's lots of different types of behavioral techniques, including cognitive behavioral therapy as a, as a treatment approach, but I was really hoping that you and I could talk more about breath work um, in particular, since I find that not only do most of us not have an awareness of our breathing, but especially those of us with these medical conditions, I, I don't use breath work as a resource to help my symptoms. I don't use it as a, a way to maybe strengthen the mind gut connection. So I just kind of want you to help me understand a bit more about that, especially for, you know, the lay person audience who's, you know, maybe struggling with chronic pain or whatever, and they have no idea that they could even use this as a source. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in breath work, um, yeah. but we try to incorporate as much, you know, breathing or relaxation in into our work as possible. I and mean, I'm probably a little bit more cognitive behavioral folks, a little bit more on, on thoughts. Um, but, um, you know, focusing on our breathing could be so helpful for, um, you know, pain in particular, you know, because I work a lot with, you know, people with chronic pain conditions, whether um, IBS, back pain, um, migraines, all the rest. Um, and really is a way to help people kind of um, tap down that, their body stress response. And it's one of the, the most important, probably crucial ways that we can do that. One of the kind of the, uh, the control mechanisms we have to kind of slow our system down a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it helps kind of take our focus away from the pain and, um, you know, energizes us a little bit more. Um, but, but I think so often it's kind of a first step um, response. I know that when, you know, when clients are struggling with health conditions, often, you know, as they start to experience symptoms, it really does kind of also increase that anxiety piece for them. So using ways to breathe to kind of bring that down a bit so they kind of work through it a little bit more can be so, so helpful and effective. Yeah, well, you said that the stress response. So we all know that those of us who have any type of uh, pain or especially, you know, uh, irritable bowel, or in my mm -hmm. case, Crohn's, there's definitely a connection when there's a lot of stress or even those of us who maybe have a lot more anxiety 
we, we can feel, we can definitely feel, and we would say that the symptoms get worse when there is anxiety or when there's a lot of stress, but you're talking about, you know, and, and I, I think this is, it seems so basic, but the reality is I'm in this field and I've never thought of it that way or used it that way. And that concerns me because, you know, it should be, it's not something that we're really talking about much as something that is existing within us. It's usually more like, okay, if you want to do breath work, go meditate, uh, maybe do yoga. And frankly, not everybody, you know, does that. I do ballroom dancing. So I've learned about, you know, breath in terms of, you know, how to be more in my body and assume that like grounded sort of stance. Yeah. But when you're talking about, you know, this being one piece of maybe the cognitive behavioral treatment that all of you are doing at University at Buffalo, can you talk about why it's important to address the stress response with the breath? Um, I, well, I think it's a couple things. I think, you know, as we breathe more, we do, we do notice our body a bit more. I often joke with clients that you know, I do this for a living. I did it for years and would never realize that I would be, um, you know, as you said, leaning on my chair a lot, I'd be trying to do this and that. And I realized that I'm a, I'm a person who holds my stress in my chest and in my neck, right? So as my, um, I'm uncomfortable and I'm not even paying attention to my body and I'm starting to stretch and do this and realizing that when I'm the most overwhelmed is when I start to try to stretch on my chair and move around a bit because I'm so uncomfortable. So I think as people become kind of aware of, um, their breathing, they do become a bit more aware of um, their bodies and where they hold tension. And I often think that if we pay attention to it, we, we physically notice that stress even before we really realize it's there. So if we can kind of know where our body holds stress and know that, you know, something's brewing for us, we could intervene a little bit earlier. And I do think, you know, breathing being one of the most um, effective ways to intervene early. But also, even if that helps us kind of notice while I'm, I'm feeling more, my chest is tighter, my arms are tighter, I'm, I'm just clenching my jaw more. Okay, let me do a little breathing. But now what's leading to that? Am I nervous about this interview? Am I upset about something that's going on later? Am I ruminating about something that went on earlier? Um, but I'm really not thinking about it because I'm, I'm just, I'm in the moment. Um, I think it really just helps to be so much more aware. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think like where... Um... People who have these, like in my case, my stress lives in my gut. Mm -hmm. So there are times I know when I'm stressed that I'm tensing my, uh, my gut, like I'm holding it in, or maybe I'm even, I think that a lot of us who come from histories of trauma, we're actually, a lot of times we're holding our breath and not even taking full breaths and not even aware that, because if you grow up in a early year, in your early years, and you're not safe and you end up, you know, spending a lot of time in that freeze response or even, you know, flight where you're just not breathing properly because you're just tightening everything. You don't realize that you're not breathing normally. Right. Something I'll hear from clients a lot of times where as we do this, they'll, they'll come back the next time to like, I realize I hold my breath all the time or I'm not even, it's almost like I'm, I'm waiting for the, the next bad thing to happen. And I'm so tense. Yeah. Right. So how do you, how do you work with people like that? They, they come in, you know, they're having like chronic headaches or they're having, you know, chronic, uh, irritable bowel and how do you, um, help them connect that their stress is causing tension in a certain body part. And then how do you help them start to understand the, the, the right way? Dr. Lackner and I were talking about this and he says, you know, breathing shouldn't be something we overthink. It's something right. that, you know, you watch a cat when they're in a deep sleep and mm -hmm. they, you can see their diaphragm right, you know, right. moving, but there's all this, uh, there's all these books out there and all these, you know, breathing was a big trend. You know, the mm -hmm. last, right. it is a big right. trend. The last couple of years where all these books are coming out and how you breathe when you're sleeping and how you breathe this, that, and the other. So it has become a little bit more, um, cerebral, I would say. Right. And so, so just, can you walk me through how you sort of break down the, the breathing process for those of us who might hold our breath or maybe aren't even aware that we're not fully breathing. <laughs> well, it, particularly with, um, you know, our first visits, we always start with kind of a rationale, really trying to link, um, you know, the brain and the gut and the brain and the body together, you know, as much as we can. 
Um, but once we kind of try to focus more on you know breathing relaxation, um, you know, try to practice with with patients, you know, really kind of show them, do it with them, which has been a lot harder with with COVID and with wearing masks and all that. But um, just trying to kind of slow it down, trying to really highlight that there's no perfect way to do this. Because sometimes clients do come in with they've seen some YouTube videos and they plug their nose with one hand and then out the other and they count and, and maybe that's fine. I mean, if they like it, it, it in some ways even makes them focus on doing it a little bit and you know, so they're not in their head so much on worrying. Maybe that's okay, but really trying to kind of show them a really simple breathing relaxation mm -hmm. um, where they just kind of breathe in a little bit, you know, feel their belly move, you know, count a little bit, breathe out and just kind of show them that pattern and really encourage them to practice as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so instead of saying, okay, do it for 25 minutes once a day, or, you know, even if they're doing it for 30 or 40 seconds, the minute they notice any, any tension, or if they're sitting in their car, or if they're in the waiting room, as much as they can just to practice a little bit and then kind of notice their body a little bit, notice where they may have have a little less tension or a little more tension and then kind of keep practicing in little increments. Make it, try to make it less um, daunting because I think yeah. sometimes relaxation can be a little intimidating to people because it is viewed as, you know, yeah. somebody sitting on a mountaintop. Um, That's right. Putting a lot of time into it, yeah. Yeah, and I think when um, when you are someone who comes from trauma and you've got a lot of history of anxiety um, and you've gone to conventional like psychotherapy, a lot of times the first thing that you're told is, well, you just need to relax. So right. that just kind of has a negative charge to it because it's mm -hmm. like, well, if I knew how to relax, I would. But then, you know, it just, it's very uh, punitive. It sometimes makes people feel like there's something wrong with them. So then they become hyper-focused on, on that all the energy around doing something wrong rather than just just being in their bodies. And as much as we can, I'll tell you know if it's this isn't something you want to overthink. You know if you're if you're thinking too much about it, just you know there's no there's no right way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but but you're right. I do think sometimes you know that whole just relax. I mean it does sound a bit punitive. Like if you just work harder, you you'd get it. Yeah. Um, and that's just not the case. I mean if it was that easy to just say relax, I mean I wouldn't have a job, I guess. So right. Now, Dr. Meyer, he mentioned in, uh, I don't know if you, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, but he mentioned in several of his books, one, one of the interventions that is really helpful for people with functional gastrointestinal disorders is abdominal breathing. Mm -hmm. Made me start to think about, okay, abdominal breathing. You just were talking about how you help your patients become aware of their belly moving. Mm -hmm. So when, when people talk about using abdominal breathing for folks to try to strengthen that mind-gut connection, is it really drawing the awareness to seeing and feeling the belly expand with the breath? Is that, is that kind of where the focus goes? Because it still feels very vague to me what, what that means. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, but often having people focus a little bit on their, their stomach as they breathe in and out. Because I do think as you work with people and you tell people to take a deep breath, everybody gives you that big chest breath, that big, yeah. you know, which, you know, we know that, you know, the diaphragm expands down or the, the lungs expand down uh, more than out. But also for so many people who hold their, their tension in their chest and their body, I mean, that starts to feel uncomfortable because if our chest is tight and we're trying to breathe out, it, it's just going to make us feel like we're taking even more shallow breaths and feel more tense. So yeah, or early on, we'll often have people just kind of sit in a chair as comfortable as they can and put their hand on their belly and almost imagine they're kind of inflating or blue in their belly. So breathe in, you know, tell them to kind of use their abdominal muscles if they have to. Imagine they're inflating that balloon, you know, breathe in a little bit and then, you know, breathe out slowly. We often tell people kind of like they're blowing through a straw, just really slow and almost like deflate that balloon in your belly. And then do that a few times, really feeling that difference. And I do think particularly working with GI symptoms, that does help people notice, you know, notice their, their you know, their, their gut a bit more. Um, and we found it pretty effective, particularly for clients who have, you know, GI symptoms because the urgency frequency, but, you know, almost any condition, it does kind of help kind of focus them a little bit more. Now, Chris, like you, you started out talking about how your really the the kind of the crux of all of this is that at your your work focuses on our thoughts and mm -hmm. how our thoughts really do affect how our symptoms, 
you know, show up. Um, I think that's the connection that you're making. And that a lot of times, you know, when we're having, if we have a symptom, we might automatically go to that catastrophe, which is, oh my gosh, you know, I have Crohn's disease. I have this uh, pain. I'm like, oh, what is it? Is it cancer? Like it, okay. it can go pretty quickly, especially for those of us who've had lots of uh, medical trauma and medical institutional trauma. And so it, can you talk a little bit about the work you guys are doing with our thoughts and why that is so important as um, part of a, a holistic sort of view of treating these conditions, especially, you know, gut-based issues, but in general, any type of chronic condition. And our, our view is that how we think about situations really do affect our, our, our body pretty strongly. You know, again, if we're having a lot of worry about um, what we think will happen, you know, we're going we're gonna to kind of feel it in, in our body and it's going to, whether it causes more tension, um, but so often we kind of, especially for someone who has a history of thinking a particular way, um, it takes some time and effort to, to shift that thinking, to change our, 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 how we think about it, to then also change our, our physical response. Um, but as you said, yeah, if, if someone has symptoms and they're not feeling well, particularly if we think of like GI symptoms, they're not feeling well and they're now all of a sudden they're now thinking about they're going to have to miss their meeting, their boss is going to get upset. Well, you know, that way of thinking generally doesn't, um, uh, you know, help us relax, help our symptoms, you know, which just kind of creates that tension, which is often exacerbates symptoms so much more for, for people. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I've thought a lot about this because I, not only do I have Crohn's, but I'm also a, a deep thinker. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. I, and I do think that the presentation of my symptoms, the more I understand how this whole thing, you know, came to be in my body, genetics and environment and all that, aside, just my personality makeup, I, I do, and no one brings this up much, you know, in all my career, and it wasn't really talked about until, like I say, I started going and spending some time and doing interviews with Dr. Meyer, but I have a very deeply ingrained pattern of thinking about the way the world works, and I tend to, um, you know, I'm very perfectionistic, and I'm very, like, high stress, I want to do things right, and I'm also, a, I'm a pretty strong worrier, so the, the interesting thing that I find about, you know, all the work you're doing at University at Buffalo is that up until I stumbled upon all of this great work, work research all of you were doing, no one's really talked to me much, even professionally about, you know, we know we do CBT in our work with our patients, but it's not the kind of CBT that I believe all of you were doing at University at Buffalo. It's, it's more of a, you kind of throw it in here and there. Yeah, maybe you know you it's it's like a an adjunct. You just kind of throw a little piece and say, "Yeah, I'm doing CBT," but you're not really doing a protocol for people. So you know we have these these, these pa patterns of many years of thinking about the world in a certain way, and it just feels really difficult to break break those patterns of thinking, like not having the catastrophizing thought or not, um, you know, thinking the worst case scenario or not kind of ramping up your nervous system with the thought, which is really what I think is the most important connection is that the thought actually sends your body into a more um, hyperactive state and, and ramps up your nervous system, which then creates more inflammation. So how do you help people to um, start to begin to break those, those types of thoughts and change them so that they can calm down their whole body system? Um, well, I mean, for one, I, I, I definitely think that so often some of these thoughts we have, especially if we're a bit of a worrier or someone who thinks a great deal, you know, it's often um, a challenge early on because sometimes these are the things that um, help people be pretty productive. You know, often it's, it's you know, you being, you know, what, what you do doing these kind of um, uh, writing kind of these, in some ways, investigative pieces. I mean, you don't want to miss things. You're really right. focused on it. But I think sometimes it's then hard to shut that off when we want to hang out on the weekend and not, you know, overthink things. Um, but I think one of our first strategies really is we have people initially monitor their, their stressful situations and their thinking. Because I think um, when it comes to many of these automatic thoughts, we just don't know 
that we do them. And we don't ask, most people don't go around thinking, what did you think about today? Nobody thinks, they just kind of go through the day. They make opinions, appraisals, views, worries, and it just um, keeps coming to try to slow them down, have people say, okay, when this happened, when you lost your keys or when you were late to an appointment, what were you thinking about? What went through your mind? And a lot of it is, is just good old fashioned practice, you know, seeing what those patterns are, um, noticing that. Um, but I, but I, do, I do think that's the first step because we can't really change anything until we realize kind of what we're doing. I mean, I think many people have, you know, some people, again, probably worry a bit more. Some people get stressed out after something goes wrong. Um, you know, some do both, but I think getting a better sense of, of where, um, what our kind of habit in that way is, and then we can work to, to shift it a little bit. Yeah. So many years ago, when I was first studying to be a therapist, I was in my graduate program. I had an assignment where I was supposed to track my thoughts as I drove on my 20 minute, you know, commute, just start thinking about like, what kinds of information did I tell myself before I got into the clinic? And I remember, uh, so, but then after we did that process, all of us, we were just kind of left with that. We weren't, we didn't talk about like, what are you supposed to do with that information? So yeah, I definitely noticed that I, I was, okay, what if, what happens if, you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing and a patient's sitting in the room and I, and I just, I don't know what to say. Like I had a lot of, of the, the what ifs associated with being a new clinician. And then I realized a lot of the stuff I was saying to myself was just, it was just pretty much all negative. So I started, it was kind of a, like an aha moment for me that, wow, like, do I say anything positive on my 20 minute, you know, commute by myself in my own head? So when people start to like kind of unpack their thoughts and they notice these trends, then what's the process? I guess, is it, is breathing a piece of helping interrupt that those cycle of thoughts? Like once there's that awareness of a certain pattern and, and the people are a little bit more aware of the kinds of thoughts they're having in certain situations, is the breath work used as a way to also interrupt that cycle? Yeah, it can be, you, you know, I do think, especially for people who, um, you know, once the automatic thoughts start coming and the negative thoughts, are, they just keep coming, right? You know, there's, there's some um, individuals we work with who, you know, let's say they're, you know, worried they're going to be late to an appointment or something, you know, they, they think about it and they, they, they're stressed out by it, but it doesn't become something um, that just kind of takes over for them. But then there are th some people who would kind of, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to late to this appointment. They're not going to see me. I'm going to get worse. You know, my symptoms are going to keep getting bad. I'm going to, um, I think particularly for those individuals, you know, even before they could kind of slow down to, to kind of write some of their, their thoughts down or try to challenge them and look at them differently, they do need to do some breathing just to kind of slow it down a bit. Yeah. Um, because if we're in a state of, of heightened stress or anxiety, I think sometimes it's even hard to can use some strategies to look at how we're thinking about the situation a little bit more um, realistically or accurately. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is often as used for, and I work with clients, we'll use it as a way to kind of slow them down a little bit, mm -hmm. um, be able to clear their head and look at the situation a little bit, a little bit more accurately. And, and then do you work with them to try to then replace those thoughts with a new narrative? Yeah, that's generally the idea is, is okay. trying to get them to um, eventually kind of look at some of those thoughts or situations. And we would even say a little bit more realistically. Um, so, you know, having them kind of really think about um, the strategy we use, we would say kind of looking at the evidence for and against those, those worries or those thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, because we really want people to look at stuff as realistically as possible, not just it's going to be great. So, you yeah. know, my early training, I worked with college students. So if I had a college student come to me, you know, one of, the day before their calculus final, all worried they're going to fail it. And we start talking about them. They say, yeah, I haven't cracked the book all semester. Well, getting them to think that they're going to do great tomorrow really isn't terribly effective, right? right. Um, where if it was the same student came in and they've had a tutor and they've studied and they've done well, well, then maybe we do just need to work on some um, getting them to look at the situation realistically, do some strategies and some breath work to help them kind of bring down their, their physiological tension so they can think a little more clearly to kind of go into that past feeling more confident. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, this this work that all of you are doing is super important to me because I write a lot of articles as you know, as a therapist and also as a health journalist. And I feel like, you know, it's just such a gap. I just, I, I, I think that people, when they are dealing with these chronic conditions, they go to the doctor, the doctor usually gives them medication. And even if they go to psychotherapy, the psychotherapy treatment doesn't really help for the most part, the majority of treatment doesn't really help people make these important connections. I mean, I didn't even in my own profession, there was no discussion around how childhood trauma and that stress response affects the gut. I mean, we know it does, we can feel it, but nobody validated that. So I just think it's really important to bring awareness to these pieces because for the work you're doing, it seems like, okay, yeah, it makes total sense. Why wouldn't people understand these connections? But for the average population, most people, you know, when they have some kind of physical symptom, it's, it's a symptom that exists separate from the thoughts that are going on in their head or the way they're breathing or the stress in their life. It's like, they just, they just, they look at it as merely a physical symptom. And I don't think that that's really changed a whole lot, you know, as a whole, like in our society, we're still very like compartmentalized in our bodies. Yeah, I think very much so, which is, you know, always so frustrating because we're seeing more and more that there's that relationship. Yeah. Um, and with so many conditions, even, uh, you know, a condition like diabetes, who clearly there's, there's you know, medical evidence, there's blood work. But we know when people are under more stress and tension and having more going on, their blood sugars have to be off. Yeah. Um, but yet, you know, often we wouldn't think to refer someone like that to, uh, uh, you know, a, an office like what we do to help them manage blood sugar. We would just keep changing medication. Right. Um, That's right. We wouldn't kind of look at it in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just naturally for people who, especially with the the high numbers of people that have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and irritable bowel. I mean, it's the, the focusing on how to pay attention to thoughts and notice how you elevate your own physiology. And cause that's really super empowering. Like when you understand that there are things that you can do to somewhat manage your symptoms in a different way, that just puts so much more power back into the patient's hands. And it's a powerless feeling when you're dealing with a medical condition to begin with. So it seems like this is such, it's so empowering the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah. And, and particularly, I do think with the, with the breathing we do, kind of when we, for the focused diaphragmatic breathing we do, when we think of the, the study we did and or most clients, particularly those in the study, that was one thing they really pointed to as being helpful, particularly feeling that they have more control mm -hmm. um, because often they would say, you know, there I am at work. I'm not feeling well, I'm getting more pain, I'm not feeling, but I have a meeting to go to, I've missed the last meeting and I can't do that. And we would work on ways for them to just, you know, do some breathing for a little while, um, 90 seconds, a minute or so to be able to get them to make it through the meeting. And they would often feel so much more empowered that they're in more control of their life, that yeah. they're not kind of victims of, of their condition. Yeah. Right. I, lo I love that. Like maybe, um, maybe you could direct me to that particular study. If, if there is some, um, if there's some, you know, a document or something on it, I would love to, to look okay. at that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's that to me, that's the important other important piece of all of this is that people feel so much at the mercy of what's going on in their bodies rather than, okay, this is something that's happening inside of me, but I'm still part of it. It's not happening to me. I'm happening with it. <laughs> Right. somehow because I think most of us you know we just kind of want to take our bodies and like sit them over to the side and like kind of like disown it and the reality is we're we're in our bodies for our entire lives so we might as well figure out how to be in a relationship with with the right. mind and the body now we can't get rid of them right can't get rid of them yeah we might want to but we can't uh, so Chris um for for therapists who are I mean, how do therapists get this kind of particular training? Because again, I'm, I'm jaded when it comes to like cognitive behavioral therapy, because the lens that I viewed it from and Dr. Lackner and Dr. Meyer have shown me an entirely different world. And now you um, hasn't been this, this type of work that all of you are doing. So for therapists who are like, yeah, I work with 
a lot of patients with chronic conditions, how can they get, is there training? What do they do to gain this, um, this, this work that you guys are doing? Um, God, that's a great question. And I don't know if I got a great, I don't think I have a great answer yeah. for that. Um, because I would say similarly, you know, my training was not, um, my, my, um, masters and my PhD programs did not have this type of focus. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't until I, um, came to back to Buffalo for my, um, uh, fellowship, my postdoc, and with the study, particularly working with IBS patients, that um, uh, I started learning more about this. Mm -hmm. um, I was pretty new to this when I started 10 years ago also. Um, I do know there are some um, organizations, um, ABCT, the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy, they do some workshops, but um, and I do know there are some, some programs, the master program, the doctor programs in the country that are a bit more um, behaviorally focused. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, some, some, some additional, for those who already, you know, have their degree and are, are working, um, I do know there are a few organizations that do some trainings, but it is uh, sometimes a little difficult, especially to get really good, like supervised training, because that takes a lot more time and effort. And you're often not around other providers that do that. Right. Well, and because um, you're research oriented, I think the, the hope is that this research that's happening all the time will eventually like, you know, get out there to the appropriate, to, to the world so that there is more of an integration of the knowledge that all of you are seeing. So that then when one goes to see a gastroenterologist, there is also, oh, okay, there's a referral maybe made for, you know, maybe you need to go see this particular type of a therapist to be able to get this treatment. Um, or, or there is some acknowledgement that, that there's this mind-body connection. The, my, the understanding I have about the way the gut microbes work is that they do take a lot of direction from, from the mind and that it's a bi-directional communication. So uh, that, you know, people can even manage to have the gut microbes become more aggressive if the human is in a fight or flight response, or if there's a lot of stress going on, that stress can actually trigger the microbes to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, what I'm wondering is that, is there a direct correlation between like actually altering the gut microbiome itself by working with the thoughts? Have there been any studies about how our thoughts do influence the way the, the microbiome diversity, the way those, um, they, the, where they interact with each other, the way they can produce more infection or not infection? Um, I do know that we, um, I wasn't part of this study, um, Dr. Lackner was, Dr. Dr. Um, uh, Meyer was, that came out uh, probably five months ago or six months ago. I mean, it was based on our initial um, study when we did our, um, the IBSOS study over the last seven or eight years, um, a portion of it was taking, um, stool samples for, to look at microbiome changes before and after treatment. And, um, though many of the patients who were in the active treatment group who kind of showed, um, improvement in symptoms also had changes in their gut microbiome that are thought to be kind of correspond to those um, beneficial changes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from our perspective, it's very interesting that a talk therapy that's focused on managing stress, tension, not diet, not medications could have a change in uh, the yeah. microbiome was really interesting. Yeah. It, that yeah. is super yeah. intriguing to me. I, I just wholeheartedly believe there's so much to that. I'd love to mm -hmm. you know, see, see it go in that direction with more studies on that. Cause I'm just thinking like through, through the years when I started to feel like I got a better handle, I, I didn't do a lot of conventional medicine in my, after my twenties, I had a lot of really serious medical mishaps. I mean, I was just thrown through the medical system and even had, um, where they hit my iliac vein during a surgery, but that was exploratory and I almost, they hit it three times, I almost lost my life. And then I had, that's the only incision I've had to my, my abdomen was not because of the Crohn's, but because it was. A mishap. So I kind of got away from uh, conventional Western medicine at that point and started going into more holistic uh, work. And that when I started understanding more about my thoughts, understanding more about like being in my body, feeling my body, 
um, more about, you know, breathing and feeling grounded and more about like that, the fact that I, the way I feel physiologically does affect the way my gut feels. I could literally feel how a stress response would like make the microbes start to like hurt. I could feel my, it's like a very interesting energetic feeling, mm -hmm. but that awareness has been really super important to me um, in terms of managing my, my condition, like more than anything else is that awareness of what, how, what I'm thinking, or even if I feel that adrenaline going through, cause I'm really stressed. I can feel like my gut just gets stirred up. And then I usually will have an infection flare, you know, after that. So it, it shows itself. And I think other patients might say that if they are aware of those nuances, but there hasn't been a lot of supportive, you know, data out there to confirm it. So that's really interesting. So when you, when you kind of feel those changes, are you able to put something in play to help kind of mitigate those at that point where it's a nice um, kind of warning sign for you? Yeah, I used to not, I used to, it would used to just ramp up. So I'd feel that mm -hmm. feeling because I didn't have any skills. I didn't know how to use my breath or to fill my feet through the floor. I mean, I didn't know how to use my body as a resource at all. So that stress level would just continue to ramp up. Then I'd go into a full-blown flare, uh, flare and then I would think I was dying. And then, you know, it would just be this really long period of recovery. Now I am at the point where I can use those uh, senses I have in my body, so to speak, mm -hmm. as a warning, like, oh, something's, you know, I've got to like take a step back and I have to do something different, you know, in my life or even in the way that I'm perceiving what's happening because it escalates pretty quickly. That's why I'm so intrigued with the work that all of you are doing because it's, it's more tangible to me when I've only been kind of doing this, you know, in my own, in my own head. <laughs> Yeah. yeah I mean, we would often tell people, I mean, the earlier that they can notice a cue and intervene, I mean, they're, if, particularly the IBS, I mean, by the time they're already having significant symptoms and it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to intervene at that point. So the right. earlier they can intervene and, and feel it in their body and change it, that's, they'll get the best results from that. Right. Or if you can kind of prevent going into that place through, mm -hmm. and I, I think breathing is really uh, crucial. In, in this aspect, because like I say, a lot of us don't breathe, we get tense, we hold, we contract our muscles, we're not, you know, and how do you really digest and move your uh, food through and everything when you're really tense. So I think that the breathing piece is a really important like first step, uh, but it has to be sort of told to people in a way that is, you know, uh, that they're not doing something wrong or that they just need to go meditate and do yoga because right. people sometimes are so elevated they can't bring themselves to that right. place of, of relaxation it's a very scary state for some people to be in especially when they've had trauma